Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for having me. I learned a lot this morning and this afternoon already. It has been delightful. Um, it's a tough act to follow Bill and uh, the previous speaker. Um, one thing I can promise is there will be one answer to something that Bill wants to know. Uh, so that's something which might hopefully be helpful. Uh, and it starts out with a story uh, when the AR5 summer policymaker came out, my student came and says, whoa, we're on the IPCC. And I said, well, okay, fine. Uh, and this is the figure you've seen now again and again. And the question was, this is the likely range of climate sensitivity. Uh, and there are one, two, three, four, five, there are six estimates down there. Uh, and actually, it turns out that two are from Penn State. One is uh, Libardoni et al., uh, which is Chris Forrest as a senior author. One is Olson et al., which is uh, myself as a senior author. And when I saw this, I said, hmm, combination. How did they get this? So we actually, we share the same puzzlement. Uh, since I'm the senior author of this paper, I actually know what we were doing, uh, more or less. Uh, let me try to explain what's going on. Uh, because this might, when we dig into this, and if we replot this in a different way, this might shed light at an apparent confusion and a real confusion, and it might point to a need to better talk, and not just talk, but actually read back whether we have communicated and how to improve the communication. So um, why do we care about this? Uh, we have talked about dangerous climate change. We've talked about tipping points and thresholds. And the issue is that you know, um, if the climate system is well behaved, then we force it a little bit and it comes back. But if there is some bifurcation point, we don't want to be here, then um, you may want to stay in the white area away from the gray area. Uh, and since this is force and sensitivity, knowing the sensitivity is where the scientist comes in. Now, if we just do as a cartoon, you say this is the sensitivity, and this is the CDF of the two examples that we have access to because they're on our hard drives. This is the CDF of the climate sensitivity by Olson et al. and by Libadonian Forest. And you can see that, well, they differ. Um, they use similar data. They use different models. And what our gray bars are is our best estimate of how to read the IPCC language. So when you say 66, the question is the likely range. What is the likely meaning of likely range? Um, and uh, our interpretation that we had in a group expert hesitation exercise, which involved lots of chocolate and uh, no red wine, was that, well, we take them at their word, they're well calibrated, 66 to, to 99, uh, and then we have here. So those are the gray bars. And to our, not surprise, to our relief, our curves do not violate the IPCC, but those are actually pretty wide uh, doors you can drive through. However, uh, many people here are not concerned about this one, they're concerned about the tail. And one thing I learned by hanging out with economists is that you may want to plot this as a survival function, which is 1 minus CDF in the log scale, which is here. Uh, here's 1, uh, and then you go down. And you, since you have a log scale, you blow up and you expand what you care about in the log. So this is 1 in 100, this is 1 in 1,000, and we stop at roughly uh, 1 in, uh, well, you know, 1 in 10,000, roughly. And the reason why we stop is that we use Markov chain Monte Carlo, and at some point we just say the computer is done. We could, of course, go beyond here, which would be a nice exercise, which we are doing right now. Uh, but it's interesting. Now, once you replot this one here, you see that the constraints here are wide. And they are very wide, which means that the IPCC current assessment is a very poor and a deeply uncertain, ambiguous, or not even uncertainly constrained on climate sensitivity and details. And if we were to ask five people about the IPCC that have some co-authorship, it's interesting that we have very different ways to interpret this. So this is just a way to maybe think about this and how this works. But let's dig a little bit deeper. And the reason is, how is this done? How do we get the combination? And the important part is that there is paleoclimate and combination, and the way they must have gotten this is the following. Um, that's at least our interpretation. They have asked a Roman. Olson to give him the data, and then they plotted it under, they plotted this estimate, the red one, as part of the IPCC figure. And what happens is the following. If we take an improper prior, basically just a likelihood function, we get the blue, which is also uniform prior, which is from here to here. And you can see the standard form which you have. 
Now this assimilates instrumental data, which means we do not assimilate paleo data, but there's information from the paleo data. If we interpret the expert assessment of the paleo data by fitting a mixture of two normal distributions, we get this distribution, which is our subjective assessment of what the paleo information gives. And you ask five people, you get five. And if you ask uh, uh, Mr. Schmidtner, you get a very tight one. I wouldn't take that one. But if you ask others, you get a wider one. Um, and then that combined as a prior with the likelihood function information instrumental gives you the posterior, which is one subjective interpretation of the paleo record with another subjective prior on nuisance parameter, a statistical parameter. So that's how it's done. Now you ask a very good question. Uh, I told you basically how sausage is being made. Uh, once you see the product, uh, you may not like the sausage anymore. Uh, but this is the way the product was done. And I will send you the two papers which describe that. So the way the combination is done is that there is a combination of paleo and instrumental data. Ideally, you would have one swoop where you account for the heteroscedastic observation error. That is really difficult. We're working on this. And so you do this by um, approximating the paleo data and then doing the full assimilation by letting priors do the work by combining prior and first year information. So um, that's the climate sensitivity. And the question was before, which is very helpful, is to say, how fast would we learn? And the analysis was, well, assume that all the people who do paleo studies are sitting on their hands, do nothing, uh, and have nothing to contribute to this. If we just observe, no, no, no insult here, um, and we just observe what we see and assimilate that, that's one example. This is a perfect model example where we have no structural error. And we just say, we assimilate the same as before. And this is the best estimate. This is 90% range. And we assimilate until 2010 or 11, when we have the last data. And then we say, what if the real climate sensitivity is high, medium, low, or really low? And what is the speed at which the credible interval is converging, the dynamics of learning? And it turns out that in the next 50 years, we do learn, but there is no perfect learning. And we learn slightly slower. What is really interesting and counterintuitive is the following. You learn slower for high climate sensitivities. That is counterintuitive because you would think sense high sensitivity, high signal, fast learning. But the problem is if you think about the, the beautiful paper by Hansen et al, where you show the decreasing response of the transient response versus equilibrium sensitivity, which is a due to the fact of the buffering in the long response time, you have a weakening of the response for high climate sensitivity. So the transient signal you get at any point actually decreases. So that is the intuition why you learn. So the point here is that um, we're actually a little bit in between. We might learn to some extent in the next 50 years. You know, we go from here to maybe one, two thirds of this. It's not a binary thing. It is convenient to have a binary exogenous analysis of learning. It's much more difficult. But the fact, the hope that we will learn in the next few decades seems very slim, unless we have a real breakthrough in the paleo analysis, like you know, we've seen certain approaches here. OK, so what does this mean now in the implications for risk and decision analysis? And here, what I would like to end out with are three points where we diagnose a problem and a few suggestions on how we react to those problems. And those problems are overconfidence. Those are interacting parameter uncertainties. And it's uh, what, how to deal with epistemic ethical interactions. Um, the first one is basically an explanation, a demonstration of, a of a prescription we had before, use a wide range of models and of real uncertainties. What we've done here is we look at an IPC ensemble, which is semi free ensemble. And this is the red points. And the red points here are the high resolution ARGCMs. And they sample a small range of climate, sensit of climate sensitivities. But if we run an Earth system model of intermediate complexity, we can actually sample parameter uncertainty. And we can get simulations that span a wider range of climate sensitivity that are consistent with our PDFs. And they're also consistent with the observed trend in, in climate. So if we filter this out, what we get is the surviving ensemble. And we see that there are simulations 
with models with dynamic ocean that have a higher climate sensitivity that pass the filter of the observations and that have a much larger range of the temperature trend in the 2011 to 2060 time scale. So, duh, very simple. My son would say, stupid. Um, if you cut off the tail and you are concerned about tail area events, you have a bias which is downward. That's very simple. So, um, the prescription to use more ensembles is, is clearly important. It's not that easy uh, because that is something which requires some time and there's an issue about how to deal with the downscaling need. Uh, so that's an open question. The second one uh, related is uh, we need hindcast. And we don't just need hindcast for the economic models which I applaud and has been done to some extent in other studies. We also need to test the models we have in integrated assessment models with hindcast skills. So what we have here is a surface temperature and atmospheric CO2. The red dots are the observations. And there is the green one is the DICE model. And the cyan and the gray one is a nonlinear carbon cycle model, which is open source, which we can use a full scale assimilation. Um, and we can see that the uncertainties in the temperature are significant. We have credible hindcast intervals. We can do the out of sample calibration if you want, but we can also do probabilistic hindcast, real observation versus what we have hindcasted, and we can also make projections. One important point I want to drive home here, just again to get off my hobby horse, uh, is that this calibration accounts for correlations, which means we have the full joint PDF of climate sensitivity, aerosol forcing, efficiency, and ocean heat uptake, and other parameters, which means that we account endogenously for the relationship between climate sensitivity and the response time, for example. And this means that much of the fat tail that is there in the equilibrium climate sensitivity, of course, is cut off or shaved off to some extent. Okay, next one. Um, are we like the drunkard who's looking under the street light? Maybe, maybe not. Um, the Satelli analysis was interesting. Um, and what I think is important is to say, what, how could we identify the subset of parameters which accounts for the highest fraction of variance in what we care about? So if you look at the DICE model, we have many, many model parameters. This is a study by Butler et al. Um, where we can group this into different ones. This is the climate sensitivity, which is one of many. And what we've done here is we ran roughly 8 million evaluations, uh, which actually we need for numerical stability. Uh, it seems to be ridiculously large, but uh, if we do bootstrap estimates of the errors, that's what we need. Um, it also knows we have a supercomputer, so that's easy. Uh, but the point here is the following. This then allows you to showcase what are the key uncertainties, which are the biggest circles. Here's climate sensitivity, here are the climate damages, Here's the investment rate, and here are population numbers. And the interaction terms, where basically the bigger the circle, the more important is this, and the bigger the link, the most important is this. This allows you to, endo to determine uh, which parameter you really have to care about and which interactions do you have to get out, which is additional test, which you do once you have calibrated it to get the a priori parameter values out. Okay. Um, Talking about correlations, um, that's an, just another uh, example. Um, is climate sensitivity varying alone sufficient? And you know, preaching the choir, Gary has shown this, I think 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it's not. There are correlations. This is the joint credible interval between climate sensitivity and effectiveness of aerosol scaling. Uh, this is the best estimate. And this leads to this hindcast and projection. And this is with the um, Earth system model of EMV complexity. If we go along this banana to higher climate sensitivity, we also have to move to higher effectiveness of aerosol forcing to account for the same Heinkest. Duh, again. Uh, and this works. We don't get the perfect fit because we are not, well, there was an issue in here, but you're not in the same thing. But you could basically, if you go to the back of the room, and you take off the glasses, then they're pretty much the same. So this, this works for me. Uh, but even with those glasses, if I go here and even go further back, the red one sticks out like a, like a sore thumb. So if we take, 
if you neglect the correlation, we just walk here, yes, it doesn't work. So account for correlations. It's simple, I'm sorry, this is repetitive, but it is important. Good, last point. Before, how much time? Five more? Okay, last point. And here I would like to slow down a little bit. And the reason is that hmm, this may be one of the things I learned today the most. This might be old news for you, um, and I should have known this, but in a sense, very smart people, much smarter than I am, much more wise, can reasonably disagree about what is the decision criteria you should apply. Yes? And it turns out that um, if you teach decision analysis to undergrads, which is actually fun to do, you start out with Bernoulli, the classic paper, and say, well, Bernoulli makes it easy to say, what can we learn? It's an epistemic question. You say, get a single PDF, you're done. Then you say, what do you value? Utility. And then you plug this into your model, you plug and shock, you optimize, you find the one strategy which maximizes the expected value, utility of, and you're done. You have your one strategy. That's fine. And there are many decisions that I would analyze this way, very clearly. However, as we discussed today, there are some decisions where we don't know which PDF is there, where we have deep uncertainty or ambiguity or nitrogen uncertainty, basically second order uncertainty, where we have multiple PDF, where we cannot identify or agree on a single well-defined PDF. And as we have discussed before, um, shown with Ellsberg and actually well before Ellsberg, um, if you look at a strategy where there is an expert A and an expert B that assess the different probability of a low performance strategy, let's think about this like climate sensitivity, and here's the expected performance of the strategy, and you have two strategies, one is the blue one, and one is the red one. The red one, if you were to average expert A and expert B saying, well, Laplace is a smart guy, and I adopt the um, insufficient reasoning, I just average him out, the best strategy would be, in terms of expected utility, would be here. But of course, you pay the price of poor performance. And then some reasonable people might choose um, the red, the blue strategy, and they would do this by trading on some to trade off some of the expected performance for the decreased vulnerability to deep uncertainty. And so, you know, this might be something. Now, uh, so far, I haven't decided on which side of the fence I'm going to go in, but I'm going to play a game, and the game is the following. Um, the role of the analyst might be helpful to analyze what are the implications of different value judgments, and then communicate this very clearly and hopefully in an efficient way. So, this is dice, this is abatement, this is climate sensitivity. This is expected utility. If you maximize expected utility, you get this one here. And if you look at the over four different uncertain parameters, this is just a marginal projection. This is somewhat vulnerable because it performs poorly in the high tail of climate sensitivity. How can you improve this one here? Yes, you can by maximizing and weighted average of the worst case performance and the expected value. So this is some decision rule which is, has been some foundation. And you can do this, but of course it comes at a cost, and the cost is that you pay some price in expected value. So far, nothing fancy. What is interesting maybe is that this increases the abatement, which is maybe not intuitive a priori, uh, but it has to do with what are the relative sensitivities to higher and lower climate sensitivities. That's one. The second one, since we talked about the expected value of information, the value of information, as Gary said, depends on what you value and what you really want to do. And so here is the expected utility, and here is the expected utility of the worst 1% of the outcomes. And so if you have no learning and you have perfect learning in 2075, then you do a little bit better if you do uh, learn, which means the value of information is the tiny difference between those two curves. As you give more weight to the worst case, you initially increase the value of information. That's because you care more. But at the end, when you really only care about the worst case, you don't have a lot because the worst case, you can learn about this, and you still have this as a case, and you need to hedge against this very much, and it happens in the future. So this is a paper which is a little bit difficult to explain. 
Um, but the intuition, the, the, you can argue about the details, but the, the main point that the value of information can hinge critically on the decision criteria and that the reason people can disagree about, that it might be useful to showcase that there is divergence about this. This is something that we may want to showcase, I think is a robust conclusion. Okay, summarizing. Um, I think it's fair to say that the current IPCC assessment is interesting, uh, but it provides a poor and arguably deeply uncertain constraint on climate sensitivity, and there seems to be a communication problem. I think we should work on that. Um, that's something I, I, I really want to do, and we, we should think about that. Um, if you produce overconfident estimates of PDFs and you care about tail area estimate risks, then you underestimate them. That's trivial to see, uh, trivial intuition, but it actually matters a lot in sea level rise. You can have orders of magnitude biases in flooding probabilities, for example. This has to do with the tail area probabilities can change drastically if you shift the PDF. There are important interactions of primary uncertainties. Again, duh. But what is beyond duh is that there are numerically quite efficient ways to identify out of a very large multidimensional PDF and the nonlinear mapping the key factors that really drive the uncertainties. In, and you can do this for different things you care about. So you can make those plots, and those plots do exist and they're on my webpage, uh, for what are the directions for climate damages, for cost, for utility, for other factors. And so you can actually look at the effect of different objectives. And I think that it is helpful and it behooves us to be very careful about prescriptive statements and that it would be interesting from my point of view to represent what are the effects of different decision criteria on the recommendations. This is something that has been done by most of the people in the audience, but I think it is helpful to expand on this and we have the tools. Thank you.